ads. Recording has started. All right, folks, welcome to this edition of the OKD Working Group Meeting. Uh, this is our meeting for May 11th of 2021 and I would encourage folks to um, go to the uh, meeting group notes and put in your name uh, for the little uh, attendance sheet there uh, under May 11th um, that link is uh, in the uh, invite and I'll also put it here uh, in the chat real quick here So we'll uh, get started with uh, Vadim, and then we'll move from there. So Vadim, what do you have for us in terms of updates? Um, some engineering points of, on the OKD. Uh, we didn't release this weekend because our previous signing key has expired. Uh, we submitted a fix for the new one, but that fix is not being accepted by CBO yet. Um, we have a pull request to fix that. We would need it to get reviewed. And hopefully this weekend we'll make a new 4.7 release. Other than that, um, I think just a bunch of small fixes landed in 4.7, so it shouldn't be anything groundbreaking. Um, last week, or was it the week before that, we released a um, release candidate for OKD 4.1, 4.8. Um, the main difference is well uh, it's kubernetes uh, 121 based and the way we pack machine os content has changed significantly no longer rely on fedora OS commits instead we build from the same configuration using the same rpms but we build our own commit layer cryo uh, all the necessary RPMs, like uh, open VM agent for um, for Obert and VM tools for VMware. Um, and that helps us to avoid using um, OS extensions. So that should make initial setup and upgrades a bit faster because all we need to do is just unpack the OS tree. And uh, once you have the new deploy, the new OS3 deployment, you would be able to check the versions of the components using uh, RPM QA command. So that's very helpful to figure out what versions have been installed. And most importantly, since with extensions, you no longer need access to Fedora uh, repos. In fact, we disable them on every upgrade. Uh, so that should make it less, uh, rather more error prone. Um, 4.8 is in so-called feature complete status, meaning significant features won't be added, but still more fixes are landing. So please stay tuned, file bugs, uh, report um, issues, and, and general feedback would be very appreciated. Um, I think that's all we have uh, from the engineering standpoint. Are there any particular bugs that stand out? Uh, uh, and things that are filed right now that are open that people would be able to help you with by testing or uh, at least taking a look at? Um, Anything stand out in terms of issues? Nothing else to mind, right really. Okay. I think um, a usual testing of vSphere, UBI especially, would be very useful. Um, we could ask for a copy of development version of documentation, which lists some new features in 4.8, like uh, proxy protocol support in Ingress. That might be useful uh, for those who want to preserve the forwarded IPs. And some more features coming in 4.8. These would be uh, very useful to test early and report feedback. Uh, bootstrap in place. That one is a tricky beast, but uh, some early testing would be very appreciated. But something to fix uh, right now, I think a lot, m most significant issues are in our infra, and those are very, uh, because they require a lot of tinkering and a lot of carefulness so that we won't break nightlies at all. 
Um, but channel testing and 4A features would be uh, great to have a look. And uh, next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of highlight the discussion section of the repo, which has gotten a little bit of activity lately. And um, uh, wanted to sort of go through these um, to see if there's anything outstanding or just to bring it to people's attention. So one of the first ones that came in was uh, the suggestion um, uh, to have exact links to um, the Fedora Core OS. Um, there's nothing that I know of right now. Actually, my script, the my OCT tools, tools script has the ability to do that because it parses through the JSON to get it, but I don't know of anything else other than what we see coming forward. Um, any comments on that before we move to the next one? I think that was, that was a good, um, a good It's effectively would be a part of, that would be a part of OpenShift install subcommand to print the exact URL to ISO, but it's coming in for eight. I don't think we can backport it to for seven, but the fix, long-term fix is uh, in the pipes. Uh, is, it to, is there any, oh, to sorry, go the ahead. Federal, Yeah, sorry, it's, it, is it to download the Fedora Chorus images for install mm -hmm. on yeah. offline or? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's the feature we added in, in for it, yeah. And uh, now bouncing over to um, 609, automated solution to backup at CD on a schedule from within the cluster. Um, where did we land on that? There was a lot of discussion. Um, is Sri on uh, today? I don't see, no. Um, but just to highlight this, I think this was a great discussion, um, automated solutions for backing up at CD. Um, so folks can check out that thread again for those that are just joining or for who are watching the video. There's now a discussion section of the OKD uh, repo that's opened up and folks are having sort of more nuanced technical discussions there about uh, features and, and things related to website and whatnot. And um, yeah, automatic backups would, would be awesome for sure. Um, but there's some complexities there, obviously. Um, and okay, any comments or thoughts on that or anything folks want to uh, mention before we move on from that one? I think it's a great, uh, good starting ticket for users who want to play with OKD on. Uh, and we have various approaches to the same problem because, well, the use cases might be very different. Some want backups on requests, so maybe a Tekton task would be easier for that. Some want a persistent uh, snapshot, so an operator is probably the best pick here. Um, I think various approaches, having some code scripted for a start would be great, and then we'll see which which one is more widely adopted and wins effectively. The other thoughts? Let's... Oh, something oh, like ahead. that, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, yeah, some cron shop at, at least would be sufficient, I think, for the most critical backups once a day or I think, I think I remember that we have to call a backup script that is always present on the nodes to do a ETCD backup and such a cron shop simply could call that script regularly and yeah, maybe copy that away to external location that you can define by changing the cron shop scripts. Bless that. Right, I think a cron shop with a container is a great starting point. The problem is you don't get any reports if it fails, so That's you might right. assume that it's passing, but it's actually even failing all along. That's right. You're relying on the it does not, nothing, yeah. And the restore procedure probably should be somehow automated, but that's something to look forward to. But uh, the container with this, which launches the script on the nodes is probably the most critical part reused in every single approach we tried, especially like the tank. So um, Crunchyop is a great starting place, which we can easily evolve into 
Tecton pipeline. And then we could write a more complicated operator on top of that and have a proper reporting, maybe even via Tecton. Um, so that, that would be a great showcase of how various technologies um, connect with each other. Yeah, let's see if we can round up some folks. There's a lot of ideas floating around. It'd be good to sort of get a concerted effort, maybe get um, a repo together. I'm happy to contribute to the Tecton aspect of it. And I think it would uh, it'd be cool if, if a couple folks from the group got together and created a little subgroup to come up with something. Uh, all right, next one is transition to C groups V2. I threw this in to sort of have documentation of the conversations between uh, the Fedora Core OS group and um, the OKD group. Um, Vidim, if you just want to talk to this for a second, the, basically it's covered in there, but if there's anything you want to add. Sorry, I missed which ticket are we discussing? Uh, the transition to C groups V2 that uh, FCOS is doing. Right. Um, so we have all the basics in 48 nightly. The only missing part is run C used by builders. So um, all the features are working. We have a pull request which can enable it, but the test failing because all the builds are effectively crashing immediately. Um, what we could do is to experiment with building our own um, OKD setup with updated builder and where we pull it. The problem is that it might be using uh, RHEL packages. So testing it in CI would be pretty complicated. But as an exercise to build a builder container using CentOS, Streams, um, Fedora would be great, um, is excellent because all we have is a Docker file starting part. And that would be very helpful because uh, the ticket is, well, filed, but it's not a priority for, for age release for, for sure, but and we'll be pushing it to, to be released in 4.9. Any other thoughts on that? Timothy, do you have any uh, thoughts you wanted to, to add to that? Um, I'm looking at the ticket uh, details and uh, yeah, even though it's not a goal right now for, for, Open shift the product. It's it's definitely on our radar. So I guess this should. Uh, I don't know how how it's going to get fixed exactly, but uh, yeah, that's it's still kind of a priority for us. So. I'll, Anyone I'll else have any comments? Any comments or thoughts on uh, C groups V two? No opinion oh. of that. Okay. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming in some <laughs> I, I should probably know this, but what are the advantages of, of C groups two versus one? I mean, what's the what do we gain from it? Um, the largest benefit is probably a fair, actual fair I/O scheduling, um, and I don't think Kubernetes uses it. But what we could have is not just for the memory, but you can also have something like a middle or a intermediate limit, which tells the application that it's time to release some memory if it can do that. Um, so that allows you to schedule um, workloads in more, well, flexible uh, fashion. But other than that, that's mostly a lot of low level things which well, just don't use parts of the kernel which are created in 2004. Um, that's all we know. Yeah, as definitely as Vanim said, the uh, the main one is all the disk access checks, the disk access accounting, and the memory accounting. Uh, having everything uh, make sense in V2, uh, much more than in V1, where you have a lot of discrepancies between between accounting and memory. Yeah. Hope for processes. The biggest thing, the biggest thing for me from a V2 perspective is 
you can trivially tie resources to a process and be able to track that um, through its children because the groups aren't based on this concept of controllers of different types of resources. They're based on where you're instantiating a scope for a process. So control groups are actually singularly grouped in V2, whereas they're multiply um, grouped in V1. And that makes it a lot harder to track and make sure that things are actually being allocated correctly and tracked. And that's why uh, a lot of things like UMD, PSI tracking and stuff like that, they all depend on V2 because you can connect all the resources you're, you're allocating to the process in question that you're trying to instantiate. So in this case, with a container that'll instantiate a scope and a slice and a, and a resource, you can tie all those resources directly to that and make it the um, distinct owner of those resources. Cool. Something to look forward to then. Uh, next one up. So this one is was an error or a perceived error. Um, is it, so we're looking at 622. Vadim, did you want the discussion section to be a place for people to put errors or would you prefer that they actually go in the issues section as opposed to in the discussion section? No, I think starting with a discussion is a good idea. Well, two starting points are equally fair because we don't know if it's an issue in OKD initially or it's just a, here I, I might have typoed or using an old release, so it might have been fixed. Um, the, we can anyway convert any discussion here into discussion, so um, that's interchangeable. Um, I think it's a great place to share uh, some logs and uh, error lines, but of course, no guarantee that we'll look into this and uh, somebody actually actively supporting this. So um, discussions like that are probably a good place. We probably should create a new, um, a special topic for this. Yeah. Yeah, category. I'm not sure how to name it correctly, but um, I think it's a great idea to group these kind of uh, discussions and tickets. Um, and, and this one in particular, OKD47 storage operator degraded. Um, basically, it's it's resolved. Um, did you want to say anything about that, Vadim? Add anything other than what you have? It's here? a common uh, problem in 4.7, including OCP, where uh, folks <laughs> don't know what they want. They have a vSphere platform, but they're not sure if they would be using machine API or they would be using storage. They might switch to CSI, which doesn't use in tree uh, drivers. So the credentials might or might not be valid. Uh, and the installation may pass if you uh, don't use those features with invalid credentials. And in order to track that, we added uh, degraded um, condition for this to verify that if you have a vSphere cluster and your credentials are invalid, we won't proceed with upgrade because it might break a lot of things. Uh, that caused a lot of discussion internally because uh, a whole bunch of people are using vSphere without using storage or machine API, so they use fake credentials. The bottom line is that it would be eventually converted into an alert saying um, you may not use that, but you should be aware that your credentials are wrong. And the upgrade would pass, but the admins would still be notified. Um, at this point, it's a requirement for the credentials to be correct, but it might not be the case in 4.7 later. Um, I don't think, I think it was, uh, it's a good, starting point where we can link people because it's not effectively an issue in OKD, but it's really a good example of how discussions should be, how they should work, yeah. Great. Thank you. Anyone else uh, have anything they want to chime in on that one? All right. Uh, I threw another one in here uh, that's from the FCOS. Uh, 
working group, uh, FCOS moving IP tables to the NFT backend. Um, Vadim, again, anything you want to add to that? That's pretty straightforward. Go ahead. I don't think it should affect us significantly, mostly because um, OKD defaults to OVN, meaning the Q proxy, the most fragile component here, would not be using NFTs, not in fact used at all. And uh, Rail CrowS, if I remember correctly, from day one has been using NFT. So all of these cases have been tested and it's just us lagging behind. Um, in any case, since in 4.8, we effectively control the whole configuration for 4.8. Um, all we need to do is just pull one Podman container. And that's a basic case where um, which Fedora Cross ensures. So when we can control the whole configuration and roll back the NFT change uh, if we have a good reason to do that. But um, I'm thinking even if we hit issues, these would be reported to the SDN team and they should be fixing it because eventually NFT would be default in RHEL if it's not yet. Uh, so I think if we have a good hand in case the, the issues would appear. Timothy, did you want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah, I'm just checking right now, but in it, it's, um, the NFT backend has been default in RHEL 8, so I agree. It's, I just realized that that actually we, we were lagging behind in Fedora Cores in a sense, but it's not by choice, it's more by by mistake. But yeah, so nothing should break on OKD side, hopefully. Uh, Joseph says, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, it's, yeah, sorry, it's, it's still the same interfaces. It's just changing the backend for IP table. So essentially it's the same command line, the same tools, just using a different backend on the day. Yeah. Anyone else uh, want to add anything to that? I like I like that new format. I have to tell you that that we discuss about issues. I, I love that. I, I really love that. The it's not format, or do you mean yes, the, yes, the, oh, yes, yes, yes? Okay. We'll we'll bring that feedback to to Diane. This is generally how I do meetings of this sort, but um, we'll bring it back to Diane and see what she says. Um, okay, so the next one that I added is um, clarify OKD's community support model. I threw this one in because um, Red Hat employees, one in particular, um, keeps getting uh, personal emails and people tagging him in the channel and all sorts of things, trying to get support from the person that they know is um, sort of the Red Hat employee uh, that's working on OKD. And so my thought is that we scour through the website the repos and whatever, and actually have a boilerplate um, couple sentences paragraph that says, what does community support mean? We have that in the big banner on the website, uh, but we don't actually explain what is community supported and community driven. And there's two reasons that this is important, I think. Number one, um, it's unfair and to the people who are Red Hat employees who are um, providing their time uh, to help out um, and probably wears on them. I'd imagine that it, it sort of um, uh, stresses them out. Uh, the other thing is that if more, if if one person gets tagged and one person is the target for it, then the community can't help because we know we've got our institutional knowledge and memory and whatever to help on these issues. And also we don't learn. Because if we're not privy to these discussions or we're sort of boxed out of them, then the rest of us can't learn about these particular things. So there's there's multiple um, advantages to this. So we talked about this at the doc groups meeting, um, docs group meeting last Tuesday, and we'll be talking about it at the next meeting. If anyone um, can join us at the docs meeting uh, to chip in on this, um, coming up with a couple sentences that we can put somewhere, uh, then, um, that would be, yeah, Bruce says reference the goose that laid the golden egg fable. Um, uh, 
then I think if, if we can come up with something in the next like week or so, and then just go through all of the OKD references uh, and plaster this up so that we can um, relieve the load on, on the, the Red Hat employees who have been, who have been bearing so much um, and, and get ourselves more up to speed on things. Sorry, would it be worth putting in, you know, to the Slack channel occasionally, you know, a, a, a boilerplate message indicating that, you know, this is community supported, you know, along with the working group email, you know, saying that this is not Vadim supported. I mean, not specifically saying Vadim, but, you know, the idea is that community members are helping. It's not just one person. They just, uh, you know, once a week put something out there or, or whatever. So people get the hint. I mean, I'm trying to help people. I know Vadim is, but you know, other people are going to have to start jumping in also. And we can do uh, channel announcements and things like yeah. that for sure. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Anyone else have thoughts? Uh, yeah, Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it sort of just occurred to me earlier today that uh, it actually might be useful to. Uh, somehow put together some information of, this is what you can do. Okay, because uh, I think what happens to a lot of people, and as I was telling Vadim, I would include myself in that list uh, on occasion, especially when I'm tired and irritable, it, or, or lazy, which is often, is that, uh, you know, the easiest thing to do is to seek help. But that that's not really a long-term strategy and uh, it's not uh, that easy in the documentation to find out. Uh, like we do have a fact, and we do have some information there. So that's certainly good as far as it goes. Uh, but uh, it, it might be useful to try and pull together some like checklists or try this or did you look at that or things that are important. I don't know. I mean, it's it's a big topic. Uh, so that's just, that's just a a vague idea of something that might help as well. And we can always link to that website. What's the website that's like how to ask questions? There's like an actual URL where someone set up a site that like you go to and it's actually like, how do you ask questions for support and for for uh, for troubleshooting and whatnot? Um, John, did I hear you say start yeah. something? Yeah. yeah. I have a I have a delay here, so I think you're done, and I start talking or whatever. I, I thought one of the what Vadim said earlier is, is doing something, you know, how to debug, you know, looking at, you know, when you get that huge log bundle, you know, how do you analyze it? I think something like that would be great um, to send to go go look at this YouTube video or something. It'll give you you know the basics as, you know, how do you get the log stack, you know, how do you do a basic analysis of it? What are the things in it that are important? Um, and that might help, you know, and, and it might help people who are, who want to help too, because some of that stuff in there is very esoteric. Um, and sometimes you just have to stumble across it. So, um, I don't know, I'm not trying to put more work on Vadim though, but that might be well, something this, uh, that's a Yeah, that sounds like a, that sounds like a very useful thing. I'm just not sure about the format. Should it be, um, a YouTube thingy, a blog post, um, text, maybe yes. <laughs> all of the above. Um, yeah, blogs are easier to reference. You know, with a with a video, you sort of have to know. Okay, this was at uh, one hour and twenty three minutes. Okay, how do I find it? Uh, yeah. Can you do a short number. video? I can I can see a yeah. YouTube video having some advantages of like someone wanting oh, yeah. to see like oh actually how do you search through it what particular things would you be looking for yeah I, exactly I, I, yeah so but this we should be limited I think we'll go, we will I think we should start with a YouTube video because it's easier and I'm not sure which parts of the process should we focus on for instance. There's a bunch of code which generates certificates. I have no idea how it works. Um, I can barely handle the OpenSSL CLI, so I probably would rather discuss the versions and the bootstrap process. But this thing also needs to be covered in some kind of a blog post and, and so on. Mm. But initial response from the video would help us to shape up the basics of the of the markdown document we would put, and then we could extend it later on. Uh, another concern is that things get outdated. Yes. Well, 
not that badly on Craig's blog post. It's still like top 10 in top 10 of OpenShift blog posts, and it still refers to OpenShift OOKD 4.5. Some pieces there are very old and not used anymore, but in general, it kind of works. Um, I suppose we would still have to update this document very, very frequently in the beginning, and then with every major release, we could we could update it. But it sounds like it's a required thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I would have time to create it from uh, from scratch to the very end, but. I guess I could have some. I guess I could create in um, in a week or two until our next meeting some drafts. Very helpful. Yeah. I mean, Vadim, I mean, if you if you want to put something together, you know, you know, a, a, a rough template. I mean, I could try to put a video together if you don't have time. Yeah, I think that that would be. I think John's making a good point. Was really if we could just get some pointers from you, like just a template of of items that you think would be important to hit, the group can handle, John himself can do the video, anyone else can ship in, and same with documentation. We don't want to add more work to you, but you're the one who handles the majority of the tickets and also knows the in, innards uh, best of anyone in the group. So if you just gave us a template of these are the things to hit, then we could run with it in all of the, the venues, be it uh, you know blog post or video or anything like that. Good idea. Okay, sounds sounds like a plan. Yeah. Excellent. Anyone else have thoughts? Uh, Does anyone want to? Oh, go ahead. Well, it sounds fine to me, but I was also just going to say that I've got to drop now because I'm going to go get uh, go on my merry way to go get my second vaccine shot. So uh, I'll see y'all later. Awesome. See you in health, Neil. Take care. Yep. You too. Bye, y'all. I need it. I think it would be a good idea to have a recording. Um, yeah, maybe a like a role play. Um, if you get a lock bundle, what you do first, and uh, just to see some uh, typical, yeah, uh, typical uh, steps that may be reprodu uh, reproducible by others. I, I'm sure because you are always so fast that you have some typical um, spots where you look first. Well, folks should feel free to um, chip in so Vadim can get us something within, let's say within the next month, right? Um, we don't want to put too much on his plate, but if, if Vadim gets us a template, then folks from the group will all sort of divvy up the tasks of getting it into the various formats, coming up with something in the various formats, blog, whatever, and, and the docs group, I'll mention this at the docs group, because there's some people going to the docs, meaning they aren't coming to this, and vice versa, so. All right, anything else uh, on this topic? Is there anything else that we can do that folks can think of um, to make it, um, to clarify what the model is, the support model is? Is there anything else we can do other than Providing this documentation and putting some boilerplate language in the various uh, places, though, where we have a presence. Anything else? I think I think a problem may be that Vadim has sure a connection to a huge internal network of people that uh, know each uh, corner of uh, the system, and most people from outside don't have that. Yeah, and I think I think uh, yes, that's that's the reason why. Lots of people ask him, yeah, because he is uh, the gateway to this internal network, and we don't have it. And if maybe it's someone has a good idea how to get a substitute to not need yeah. the internal network, but to know which repos are they working on, how we can contact them through issues, and so on. Um, that shouldn't well happen. Uh, the internal knowledge is, of course. A huge source, but it's not being used in every single report. Most issues are very trivial, mm -hmm. um, and I think like three or four of our architects are 
or an OpenShift dev. So you mm-hmm. can think I can name drop later, but <laughs> I don't think they would like it. Um, <laughs> yes. And the real the the real way to handle is probably starting with some. We have a bunch of issues logged for uh, OKD, and showing activity there would be very helpful. Just some basics, like um, here is how I understand Bootstrap. Here is what I see from Log Bundle. I'm stuck here. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I could jump in and help and extend this, of course. But a lot, a lot of issues are just. I, I'm thinking folks are pinging me directly just because I respond there, and and respond on every single <laughs> uh, issue. And people assume that I'm the only one here. Well, um, that's the belief we should. Any other thoughts on this? Well, until we get cloning available, we can't clone him. <laughs> right, exactly. Now, I remember see. as we I remember as we were searching for um, John uh, Vadim and I was searching we were searching for an OVN Kubernetes problem, and finally, um, I think um, Vadim got us the first uh, yeah first steps. And John and me were searching through the community. And finally, I think uh, the guys at John, do you remember, uh, at the network manager, um, um, I don't know what the chat is called now. They helped us. And just finally, I think it was a solution. So you don't yeah, need always a single person. Uh, never. I think it was a great example of how it should be structured. I. My network knowledge is very limited, and I'd rather not extend it, actually. Um, so this is why I would rather pass it to some professionals who can chase folks on IRC and uh, help with some details I don't, I don't fully understand. Um, we, should, we should learn lessons from this and structure our workflow in a similar fashion. And it may be that there are bugs that, you know, you know, like we did, we created that, that sort of private Slack group or whatever with the three of us, but there may be issues that, you know, we can get if we need to get three or four people in where it's easier to have a discussion in that private channel, you know, versus the open discussion, then publish the, the findings afterwards because sometimes you get chime in after chime in and after chime in and it gets distracting. It's all good, but distracting. Yeah, there was there was a good a good idea which we implemented. Yeah, uh, some ad hoc chats for the interest of people was certainly a good um, a good idea. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, move on now. I think we've we've got a great foundation now for this particular topic uh, to move forward with. Um, and uh, I'll go back and um, uh, fill in the discussion uh, item with sort of what we discussed uh, here at the meeting so that we've got sort of a clear record in that actual thread. And that's the other thing is if you put something in the discussions and we talk about it at the meeting, if you can update uh, the discussion item, if you created it, folks, that's helpful um, and sort of keeps things organized. Uh, and then the last thing in the discussions is insights operator is degraded. Um, Vadim, is there anything you wanted to add on that one? No, I think we need logs because there are multiple um, things which could be causing it. It could be proxy. It could be actual, well, unlikely, but uh, actual uh, downtime of the insights operator for some short time. Um, well, if we would have logs, we would we would have some something to discuss there. Yeah, we'll point out that uh, Vadim says that's great, but I'm not a dedicated OKD support person, and this community should have access to it. And I do think that's an important thing. Again, is the community, you know, we can't lift the community up if we don't have access to these logs as well. Um, we talked about um, the issue of identifying information. Um, 
does anyone did anyone come up with or know of like just a simple bash script that cleans things up um to make it easier that we could just post and people could download it and scrub anything you know because you know host names people feel that that's identifying and you know any ip numbers and stuff like that maybe we just come up with a simple bash script that cleans that out well we what could have something cool? like a an obfuscator or something like that, yes. The problem is that they have to be consistent. You can't replace every host name with local host and, well, expect us to make sense of it. Right. Um, that's, a, well, that's a complicated topic, of course. Um, if we scrub too hard, that might not help us say, maybe your password is wrong, or maybe, well, you scrubbed it wrong. Um, yeah, we don't have a great solution for this especially anything privacy related solution um, uploading uh, this oh, sorry hold on who was that i didn't see who it was that was talking hi uh here's eric ah, mm -hmm. um what is the sos tool doing because this is now also scratch of logs i think since maybe half a year ago yeah, but aren't, aren't SOS logs going to Red Hat and stuff? I mean, you have a certain concept of security if things are being sent to yes. Red Hat. Yes. We um, have the whole customer. Shit. We have the whole customer portal and GDPR things and CCSA, which is, as a community, you know, can you certainly don't want to deal with. Um, and legal, yes. Um, the SOS tool is a shell tool, right? You call it and it collects stuff for you. Yes. And the problem is the, the, logs. the problem is sharing the results. The log bundle is built in a similar way, but uh, some information might be considered sensitive. Let's put it like this. I don't think host names are sensitive. Some folks think they are. Um, and we need some way how to have them replaced with some fake names but still make sense in the end um and that's virtually impossible the tool would do it. um no rather it was not built for that and another problem is we also copy a lot of certificates which effectively in the end have the host names embedded in them you just have to extract them probably our solution would be to avoid scrubbing, but to upload some um, temporary place which would auto delete it after a um, couple of hours or days. That would give us the full information and severely limit the time for attack. Um, again, this is a Security through obscurity, but that's probably the best we've got. If we have any other ideas, um, that would be very welcome because the log bundles are expected to not have all the sensitive information. And the same applies to must gather, but in order to identify all the issues, they effectively have to also read data from user namespaces so that we could understand maybe it's a PDB blocking the upgrade or something. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we've only got 14 minutes left and we've, we actually had a larger discussion a couple months ago um, about this that, that took up a significant amount of time. Let's regroup on this at the next meeting, but maybe if we came up with a list of things that people do feel are um, uh, concerning, uh, uh, items from the logs that are concerning, if we generated a list and then said, okay, how could we tackle this? Can we tackle this? Then we actually know what we're looking at. Um, and some folks in the group maybe not be familiar with must gather. So let's, let's table this. But in the meantime, if folks could just in their minds who are familiar with must gather, think about some of the things that would be problematic and maybe I'll send something to the group, um, share out like a Google doc or, or maybe a in discussions. Yeah. And the discussions actually, we could do it in there. Um, in the discussions, just generate a list of things that we think could be viewed as problematic 
and again, we're just we're having to put ourselves in other people's place and and what they would think would be um, problematic in in that. And uh, then from there, um, at the next meeting or a future meeting, discuss ways in which we could um, ally those concerns a little bit. Does that sound good? Yes? Okay. All right. Uh, and that's it for the discussions. Um, uh, Timothy, did you want to bring up anything from the uh, Fedora Core OS world that, that you think that uh, folks should know about? So um, right now on the Fedora Core side, we did this last week uh, on testing for Fedora 34. So that's not a direct impact on OKD because um, OKD doesn't switch when Fedora Core is switched, it switch when uh, machine OS content gets pushed. Uh, but yeah, so essentially it's it's coming. <laughs> um, apart from that, I think uh, we've already discussed C group V2, which is one thing, the move to NFT, which is second one. The count me changes are coming later in August. Uh, just a reminder for folks, um, the, starting from the releases in August, so maybe not the releases in OKD in August, but a little bit later, uh, default, the, the default will be on Fedora Cores uh, that you will uh, send a account me request to uh, the Fedora servers. So essentially it's a very privacy friendly way of counting the number of Fedora Cores node buildings uh, running uh, on the planet. <laughs> and for us to have uh, some kind of statistics of uh, how many people are running Fedora Cores. And uh, yeah, so this one is coming around August and uh, there's already instructions. There's a magazine article coming up like probably next week or this week or next week to explain how to disable that. Maybe we could have something specific for key to disable that, but it's, it's essentially a two line machine config. So it, it should be fairly easy. And uh, yeah, I don't think we have anything more like really, really important right now happening besides all of that. So I guess it should be good. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about about the signing discussion? That was that took up a lot of time at the last meeting, and it, I think it does relate to OKD nodes in the way that people might keep them around for a while if their cluster is running a long time, etc. True, but does uh, I I was thinking about that one, but I does it really? I don't. I'm not sure it impacts OKD because. The updates on OKD does not happen the same way they happen on Fedora Crest Classic, uh, okay. I would say. So maybe maybe I'm wrong here, but I think OKD should not be impacted by that. So the, the issue in general is that if you start from a very old Fedora Crest node and you update, you try to update to a, a fresher version, you'll get issues because you won't get you won't have the signing keys to verify that the latest version is actually a valid one because you're running a very old node and potentially you're out, you're, you're way out. Um, you don't have the latest keys to verify that because on Fedora Core S, we, well, Fedora in general, we only ship the next two releases keys um, in, in, a, in, in an image. So if you're starting on Fedora 30, for example, and you want to upgrade to Fedora 35, then you won't have the, the key for Fedora certified. But that should not be an issue as far as I know on OKD because uh, on OKD, you, the updates happen, they are the MCO uh, so uh, and, uh, and the machine OS content distributed uh, on the cluster. And uh, there's no, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not pulling uh, any content from a from a sign or S3 repo, so it's it's not exactly updating the same way that we update the classic Fedora OS nodes. So uh, yeah, I may, I'm not 100 percent sure. So maybe about him, you could confirm that. But uh, yeah. Um. Right. There is a very unlikely case. Bruce has mentioned it that if you start with 
Fedora 30 Core OS as a bootstrap node, and then you want to install the which is probably based on Fedora 49. In that case, you would, of course, fail. Uh, but that's pretty easy to prevent by using uh, a fresher Fedora Core OS. As for upgrades, right, we don't use native uh, Core OS mechanism. We upgrade from one major version to the other. So it may not even span Fedora releases at all, but in the worst case scenario, it's Fedora 33 to 34. And uh, we can also pull out the edge to prevent that upgrade from happening if we find some issues with that. Um, so yeah, I don't think that would affect us. I just wanted to bring that up in case it did, and, and at least we're aware of that, which I think is a significant change, because there are people going between both groups and sort of playing with FCOS and playing with OKD at the same time. Um, in the last few minutes, we have seven minutes left. I want to talk about um, the uh, KubeCon office hour. What did we learn from that uh, in terms of our audience, in terms of our um, uh, our ability to communicate our ideas, our ability to answer questions. What, how do folks think that came out? Uh, for those that were there, for folks that haven't, um, we can put the link to the video which was posted. For me, I had big problems um, to follow the correct chats because there were uh, lots of chats and Q&A chats and main chat and background chat. I think it's a little bit too much. Um, I don't know, what's your impression? I, was following. I think that's why they have a moderating person to sort of sift through the questions for us, right? Um, I think yeah, I was there were a lot of new people. Following the Twitch people. chat was apparently. Sorry, go ahead, Vadim. Um, yeah, I was following the Twitch chat and apparently had copies from everywhere, like at least from YouTube. But following the moderator was apparently a better idea because they know how to like switch topics and slowly move from one topic to the other, so you wouldn't have a whole mass of different chats. Um, my impression there was that it was great, except when folks started uh, with what's coming in 4.8 and 4.9, which are very technical issues. Um, we shouldn't have to answer them, but we should have a prepared answer like. Here is where we post the release notes. Um, here are the links to our workgroup meetings and so on. Um, what I think I would add some more discussions about that it's in not just a free version of OCP, which is not true, uh, but it's rather a community version where you can affect every single detail of your OKD cluster. Uh, folks were asking why you're not starting with uh, RHEL core OS. That's exactly the reason, because the community cannot contribute to it directly. They would have to go all the way from uh, upstream to Fedora to RHEL. Uh, and that shows the value. Like, if you found a bug in it, you don't have to wait for RHEL support to uh, pass it to engineers, have it fixed, and pass it back. You can start tinkering with it immediately, just like we did. Um, a lot of times. Um, uh, the next suggestion is probably mostly for internal developers, but uh, we we should mention that we did a lot of things which landed in OCP, like the whole Ignition version 3 started uh, in OKD and later only based on a bunch of fixes all of us have submitted landed in OCP. Um, and the whole OVN as a default was a great testing platform for the folks to decide should it be a default as a DN or not. Uh, that means you might hit some more bugs, yes, but that also means you also get a feeling of um, how the distribution would look in, in a couple of years. The whole C groups v2 perfect example. Um, we might want to enable this in OKD if it works great, if it brings benefit to the community. 
because uh, OCP is more conservative and we have uh, our hands untied, we can do whatever. Um, yeah, complex topic because folks might think that we test new features on them. This is not, well, that's not entirely true. Um, and probably uh, that's a very, very complicated topic, but once we should actually make a point of it that uh, OKD is a place where you can get latest and greatest features. And since the whole community is looking at it, uh, your chances to have them fixed sooner are actually multiplying. But other than that, I think it was, it was great. It felt refreshing to see a lot of new faces asking questions, both the, the beginner ones and more complex ones. It feels like the community is actually growing and Logity is not even one year yet, uh, Logity 4, I mean. So that felt um, very rewarding. I thought one thing is that we'll have to find, um, this is assuming that it uh, moves forward. Diane was saying that if, if it went well, that we had the chance of doing like a bi-weekly. Um, I think that would be fantastic. I haven't heard back if that's the case. Um, one thing I think we would want to do is find what's the right level of support to provide in these office hours? How are we going to start looking at people's logs? I We got a question along those lines of like, here's a big log error. Are we going to start looking at that or at, at when, you know, we'll have to figure out what's the threshold, low and high, um, for saying, okay, this needs to happen offline from the show because otherwise it would take up, you know, a significant amount of time on this one particular issue and we wouldn't get to anyone else. Um, so that, that would be my only thought. Um, anyone else? I, I guess, um, well, I don't know. Bayweekly might be a little bit too much for, for the office hour, but uh, certainly up to, um, up, uh, not up to me to decide. Um, but yeah, we could maybe monthly or something like that. Um, and uh, well, I, I'm not sure office hours are great for debugging session either because they will just pin down a lot of people for just one issue, one specific issue. So yeah, okay. Um, I'm not really in favor of that, but yeah, it's uh, it's still open for question. Anyone else? Yeah, I think live debugging is a little chancy. All right, we have one minute left, and I do want to be mindful of people's time. Uh, is there anything else that uh, folks want to bring to our attention before we? Um, uh, step away from this meeting. Right. Well, thank you so much, folks, for your time. And thank I'm you, gonna... Jamie, for running the meeting. Yeah, oh, good meeting, Jamie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're you're welcome. Um, and if folks like this format, then um, we can um, you know mention it to Diane. Um, I'm happy to facilitate in the future. I don't I don't know what what's uh, uh, behind that, but uh, she might be interested in, in letting me co-chair or whatever for it. We'll see. I don't know if it has to be a Red Hat person or not. But um, uh, this was great, and uh, we'll uh, talk in two weeks and also online and use the discussions. And uh, don't forget the docs meeting is next Tuesday if you're interested in docs stuff. All right. Take care.